Jackson Alexander Miller was a 19-year-old from Cupertino, California. On May 15, 2010, Jackson took the family car, pretending to go to an AA meeting. The vehicle was found in the parking lot of the Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. However, later videos showed Jackson walking away from the bridge, not toward it. He was never seen again. I'm Ed Densel, and this is Unfound. As we've learned over the three plus years of Unfound, probably one of the toughest things to determine is whether a fact is an actual element of the disappearance, or is it just a coincidence? Some examples. Was the sex abuse going on at St. John's in Minnesota the reason Joshua Guimond disappeared, or did the two have nothing to do with each other? Did the argument Helen Diamond had with her husband before she disappeared have anything to do with her going missing or not? Was Jonathan Estes' last conversation about going to talk to the police before he disappeared the thing that caused him to go missing or not? The truth is, we just don't know. And really, the way each of us analyzes the same set of facts has more to do with our own life experiences than anything we could learn in any class. If you hate the Catholic Church, you'll be more inclined to think the monks killed Joshua. If you suffered in an abusive relationship, you'll be more likely to think Helen's husband killed her. If you hate the police, then you'll be more inclined to believe a police officer killed Jonathan Estes. And I could go on and on and on and use Unfound's cases as examples. Well, today you're asked to determine once again whether something is a fact of the case or just a fact. The Golden Gate span looms large in this disappearance due to its reputation as being the number one site of suicides in the United States. But has that point clouded this investigation from the start? And is it simply just a bridge too near? And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Good's website charlieproject.org. Starting in his teens, Jackson Miller struggled with his mental health. He could go for long periods of time with no issues at all. Then for long periods, he would be the exact opposite. Jackson didn't like taking his medication and tried many different things, including marijuana, in an effort to stay away from his prescriptions. Through it all, though, Jackson tried to get an education while living at home with his parents. So on May 15, 2010, Jackson was at home. As soon as his mother left for an appointment, Jackson told his father that he was going to an AA meeting. Jackson was not an alcoholic, but he found the meetings helped him cope with his own struggles. Jackson left the house. His family later discovered there were no AA meetings in the area on that day. Jackson had lied. A few days later, the SUV was found in the parking lot of Golden Gate Park. Video showed Jackson getting out of the car and walking away, but not in the direction of the bridge. He was never seen again. Security cameras showed no one jumping off the bridge on the day Jackson parked the car. Over the next few days, people in the area reported having conversations with a young man fitting Jackson's description. Although there is no proof, it was he. Jackson's disappearance is included in a group now known as the San Francisco Five. Five young men who disappeared within blocks of each other between 2010 and 2013. Each of the cases is unique, and we at Unfound do not believe they are related. But these are the main questions regarding Jackson's disappearance. Number one, was Jackson's disappearance a plan by him to make it look like he committed suicide when he really didn't? Number two, did the police use the Golden Gate Bridge as a convenient scapegoat as the reason for Jackson's disappearance, even though there is no proof Jackson ended up on the bridge? 
and number three. If you've watched the documentary The Bridge about people who have jumped to their deaths from the Golden Gate Bridge, do you believe Jackson would have been seen by other people had he jumped from that span? Jackson's family remains hopeful that he's still out there alive. The guest for this episode is Jackson's mother, Gina Funaro. Unfound news. Yes, you are correct. There was no January 2020 unfound newsletter. Why? Well, two reasons. Number one, my dad was here and there just wasn't enough time. Trust me, he saw me doing enough work as it was while he was here. And number two, doing the update episode at the end of 2019, I thought covered anything I would have written in the newsletter. But yes, I'll be back to it at the end of this month for the February 2020 newsletter. Next, there are many new videos now on the Unfound podcast channel on YouTube. That is the work of my new assistant, Natasha. She is putting those together all on her own. So please take the time to check them out. And finally, there seemed to be a problem once again with Spotify last Friday. The Lisa Shuttleworth episode was only like half the length it should have been. Luckily, I was able to get it sorted out pretty quickly. But as I've stated in the past, when this problem has showed itself, totally out of my hands, but I'm the only one who can fix it. Go figure. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on Podomatic, iTunes, Stitcher, Instagram, Twitter, Spotify, and Facebook. On Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, please join us on YouTube for the Unfound Live Show. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. This week, I need to thank Delane. You can also contribute at PayPal, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. That is also the email address. Merchandise, the books at amazon.com in both ebook and print form. And what do I say? Do not forget the reviews. Shirts at unfound-podcast.myshopify.com. Cards at makeplayingcards.com forward slash sell forward slash unfound podcast. And please mention unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound the mother of Jackson Miller, Gina Funaro. Gina, welcome to Unfound. Thank you. Let's talk about you being Jackson's mother mother first. How many children do you have, and how did Jackson figure into as many as you have? Maybe he's your only son. I, I have to admit, I'm not sure right now when I ask this question. How many children do you have? I have two children, and Jackson was the first. The first, okay. And was your other child a boy or a girl? Uh, girl. Girl. He has okay. a younger sister. Younger sister. And how would you say the two of them got along? You good? Um, they got along <clears throat> really well until they didn't. <laughs> and when he left, um, they were not getting along well. And okay. that was his high school years, basically. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, were they were they close in age? And uh, they were two years, nine months apart. Wow. Okay, so fairly, fairly close, I guess. Okay. So you have two children, a daughter, a son. And let's talk now a little bit about Jackson. Uh, as, a, as a young boy, let's say maybe 8 to 10, 12 years old, you know, what was he into? What did he get into as a little kid? Um, he was very into video games. He loved to read. He uh, was very good at sports. He was an amazing swimmer. He huh. played soccer. He was good at running. He did track. He did a little bit of baseball, and he wrestled. And, wow. And um, he played the piano, and... Um, 
maybe I should have asked, is there anything he didn't do? Gina, that's a lot. You had him very busy. <laughs> Uh, I would say when he um, he was extremely busy and extremely active until um, until the beginning of high school. Okay. Well, then let's talk about that. Why why did that change? Um, in the in the during the summer um, before high school, he had decided. Um, we encouraged him, and then he chose a uh, private school to go to for high school. And he had gone to public school through eighth grade. He had a girlfriend at the end of in, through the end of eighth grade, and then um, as the year ended, um, she found out her family was going to move. Mm. So they were going to move out of town, and he was course very upset by that yeah but then he also was gonna change schools to um, a private school where he didn't know anybody but one person he and his friend decided to go to the same school together so other than the friend he he didn't know anybody so Mm -hmm. um, between I think the depression of the girlfriend moving, who he was super into, and um, the anxiety of going to a new school. Um, towards the, um, and then he was we he was going to be on the water polo team at the new high school. He had been playing uh, recreation water polo through the local high school, so it was kind of um, he was going to do this water polo and. I thought it would be a good idea to um, get him acquainted with the um, water polo team before school started because um, because once school started, I knew it was going to be academically really difficult and there wouldn't be much time and it would be nice if he had some ready-made friends from the water polo team before he started high school. Right. So they were doing this trip to Hawaii Um, before school started and it was supposed to be for kids only um, like sophomores through seniors who are already on the team but um, since he had been practicing with them in the summer um, I said could he go on the team so he could meet them so they let him go and it turned out to be a really bad decision he got extremely anxious and Mm. He started exhibiting um, what we now know was um, obsessive compulsive disorder, Um, but we had we didn't know that that's what we were looking at at the time. Um, We thought that some of the things he was doing, like um, kind of uh, separating himself from the group and um, sort of you know hiding from things, we thought that these were kind of uh, you know, he was just being difficult and being yeah. um, obstinate and you know, being a teenager. Yes. But um, we, you know, it's very difficult, especially with your first child, to know um, what things are normal and, you know, normal teenage behavior and what are extreme. So, you know, the hindsight is twenty twenty. So the result of this was that he was starting to have um, uh, this obsessive compulsive disorder, which is basically anxiety that um, manifests itself in um, just not being able to do certain things and, like, trying to mm, do things to calm yourself down. Like, one thing that he would do is he would... He always had to take down this mirror in the bathroom that he didn't like. And then I would get super mad at him because I was like, this is my bathroom. What are you doing with the mirror? You know, so we started just really Hmm. getting at each other. And he ended up getting in trouble in this, on this Hawaii trip. So we found him off on a really bad foot with, uh, the school and the team 
and the friends. Um, so all of the boys would be going, like they were supposed to stay together. That was the big thing, you know, because the chaperones would yeah. have to watch all these teenagers. Of course. And then he, he would like stay in the room in the bathroom. And because he wasn't comfortable with these other guys. And as it turns out, the team was also very clicky and they were very, I found out through other, you know, people that they were tough kids, you know, to really mix with and there were mm-hmm. some that weren't particularly nice, but he didn't handle it all very well. And um, at one point, he, um, he, I th- you know, he was trying to fit in and he did something where he, you know, he was going by some Hawaiian um, walking home from the pool and they wanted to sell him some pot and so he bought some marijuana in a bag and it actually turned out to be oregano Mm -hmm. but he thought it was he thought it was real so the Hawaiians were playing a trick on him and then he went and I think he like sold it to one of the boys or something and he was trying to I don't know fit in somehow and then they knew it was oregano and they thought he was I don't know but anyway it was awful so um so that whole thing blew up, and I, of course, didn't understand it very well, except for on the way home from the trip, the chaperone, I believe it was, and the coach told me that Jackson was, that it was really, he was a trouble, he was trouble during the trip because he wouldn't listen to them, he wouldn't stick with the group. Mm-hmm. And um, and then somehow the, the captain said something about, oh, I know, somebody accused him of stealing a bath pack, but he didn't. Anyway, they all, t- and so I made, when he came home, I was super upset, and I walked him into the coach's office, and I made him do all of this written apology and all of this kind of stuff. And then all this was before the first day of school. Wow. And And he was going into what grade? Ninth. Wow. So that was the week before school started. And he ended up, every year we go to Newport Beach for a week. It's a family trip with family friends. And he met us there. And I get the phone call from the chaperone with all this bad news and we're all angry with him. Everybody's angry with him. He's all about to, you know, start school and um, he's super upset about his girlfriend. He's nervous about all these kids who hate him now. And then, um, and, but, you know, we didn't really know everything that was going on. Right. You didn't, you, you didn't understand yeah, you didn't understand there was something mental going on with him. You just thought he was just misbehaving to misbehave. We thought he was being defiant about the yeah. rules, but yeah. we didn't realize. So he, later he told us that um, the reason he wasn't with the group was he didn't like the way he looked and he was worried about So that's part of OCD is like mm-hmm. being super self-conscious about the way he looked. And so he was in the bathroom, and he didn't want to come out, you know, those kind of things. So it it was some stuff that we needed to help him deal with, but we didn't know. He wasn't open about what was happening. Right. So he, um, so the first day of school, we had the carpool all set up with, you know, three different parents, and they're because he was going to private school, we had to drive them. So the carpool's got to come, or we're about to drive, and he disappears. And this is the first time he ever disappeared. And it turns out he 
ran uh, out up to the park, up the street, which was, you know, literally right up the street. And um, and so we go out on a bike, we find him, and he's up in the park. And, of course, he doesn't, like, break down and tell us what's going on. We're just like, you have to go to school. What's go- You know, what's going on? And, you know, looking back on it, you know, I sort of sat him down and really, you know, not yelled at him, but figured out what was going on. But instead, I was like, you know, there's no choice. You have to go to school. You pick the school, you got to go. Um, and so that was the beginning of um, some, the, the beginning of difficult times with them. And um, and it happened. It sounds to me the way you're talking about this, Gina, is. It happened somewhat quickly. Well, he he had some other difficult things in junior high, mm-hmm. but the OCD, those kind of symptoms, the anxiety, wasn't super bad. You could tell by the way he was walking. Like people thought he was super like cocky, kind of confident. But I could tell by the way he walked, he was just super self-conscious, you know? He was like, you know, have you ever seen a teenager who's just kind of walking on the balls of his feet and he's like, you know, sort of swaggering along? And you just know he doesn't feel comfortable in his skin. And that was him. He just, all of, you know, just as he started to go through puberty, he went through puberty very young, the girls fell in love with him. And they were older, and they started, you know, coming to his door, and he said, oh, they're silly, they're crazy, and he couldn't really handle it, and he didn't know what to do, <coughs> until, until all of a sudden he did go through puberty, and then he knew exactly what to do, and then he, you know, started to get involved with girls too early, and and it was the older girls, so they were super advanced and sexually, and he, you know, was too young, and so he went through puberty when he was, like, in sixth grade, so by seventh grade, he was almost full grown, so that year, he just grew up super fast, and then he did have, like, in his seventh or eighth grade, he had, like, his first experience with, an, you know, with another friend mm-hmm. or something, mm-hmm. um, taking a bottle of alcohol and drink, you know, going out and drinking. So, you know, he had those incidences where, you know, he you know, had, had done that behind her back. And um, and then he had this serious girlfriend who we were trying to, like, make sure they were never by themselves. And sometime, you know, right before he graduated from eighth grade, they managed to go off and, you know, be sexually active. So, and so he... All these things were just happening okay. really fast and yeah. way too young. Right. And then, and then the high school thing. And so the freshman year in high school, that first school, he, um, we started, you know, noticing the, these very obvious OCD signs. And so we, um, he started to see a um, psychiatrist, they, and a psychologist. Is that what you recommend? Were you the one that recommended that? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, and then they 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 started diagnosing him by trying by giving him medication and seeing if that was the case. That that was what he had. It was ridiculous. He also had gotten an educational evaluation. That said he had, this was also that same summer, he said he had um, ADHD or, um, and Mm -hmm. so they thought that they would put him on some medication and he didn't really have, uh, it wasn't, it was not the right medication and it made him really um, uh, angry when it wore off and that lasted a couple days. So they really didn't, the, the psychiatrist and the psychologist really didn't know what mm-hmm. the diagnosis was 
for a long time until we switched, until like the next year when he finally went to somebody who said, you know, who mm-hmm. let us, who we realized he had OCD. And he started to do things that were more obviously OCD. And um, so anyway. And how would, and then if you brought these things up to him, uh, what would he say? He had a really hard time expressing what was going on. He used to say that he had repetitive thoughts in his head. Mm-hmm. And then you would ask him what kind of thoughts, and he would say stupid things. You know, he's like, they're just dumb things, like, you know, that person is really ugly, or that per- you know, or, you know, I don't look good, or, you know, um, or something that was just, like, bothering him that he couldn't get out of his head. Okay. So, so kind of an obsession, like uh, like OCD, an obsession on something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So he, he had really hard time going to school, and between all the doctor's appointments and... Um, and the school being very um, rigid about um, missing, you know, a certain number of classes, and then you then you got an F on the assignment if you missed a class, and they were super rigid with him, and they, we didn't, we didn't, um, we probably should have just had him stop out of school for a while, figure out what was going on, and then continue. But, you know, around here, it was just like you needed to, like, stay with the program. And if you, you know, otherwise you just kept falling, falling, falling behind. Behind, right. So we tried to stick to the program for his freshman year in high school. And he ended up, by the end of the semester, basically failing out. And we just realized that, you know, the school wasn't going to work for him. And, um, and you know, we were going to need to have him somewhere where he, we could just figure out what was happening to go to his appointment and um, and you know he wouldn't be so stressed out and uh, so he ended up switching schools after Christmas after the first semester and there was another boy who knew about the school and I was worried about this school because it was kind of a school with a lot of kids who, you know, weren't able to handle um, the more rigorous schools and stuff. So, um, you know, it was very, very diverse, and I didn't know, you know, what the drug situation would be like. And it was it was really easy for him, and so it gave him lots of time. And he was super smart. Um but he wasn't good at school, you know. He, mm-hmm. really, he didn't have executive functioning, you know. He okay. didn't have the organization, but he was really smart. So, was, he, was he able to make any friends at all while going to this school, to any of these schools, that, that, any friendships that's la- that lasted? Um, starting in freshman year, he had a really hard time with that. Mm-hmm. It was really difficult for him. Okay. He, he's the, so he went, yeah, it was just really difficult. Okay. So uh, he even had this good friend of his who went to that school who tried to get him to go on a wrestling team and he started to do the wrestling, but he didn't really stick with it. So, mm-hmm. um, so then he went to this other school, and and then, then... Was there anything over this time, like when he started ninth grade, up until, you know, you know senior year? Of course, he was 19 when he disappeared, but anything that worked at all? Any sort of counseling, any sort of drugs, any sort of therapy that seemed to work at all, in your opinion? Um, at one point, um, he found a, a doc, uh, um, 
psychiatrist that helped, um, he he figured out that um, he should put him on something called Lexapro, and um, that seemed to help. But he prescribed it wrong. He prescribed it for him to take in the morning, and it made him really sleepy. And he should have been taking it at night. I've since learned that it, it makes most people really sleepy. So it would have been great to take at night, um, but instead he kept falling asleep in his classes, and he became known as this person that was always falling asleep in classes, which is not a good thing either. Which didn't um, help. Which didn't help his already strained relationship with his classmates, I'm guessing. Right, he used to always just nod off. He almost, it was like narcolepsy. As soon as he got in class, he would nod off. But I think a lot of it had to do with this medication that he was taking. And then, but, you know, it did help with the anxiety. There was at one point where we completely took him off everything that he was taking, and we tried... Um, uh, vitamin supplements and a, nu- and a nutritional diet. We, we I brought him to a what's called a um, nutritional psychologist, and we decided, you know, no more drugs. And that was, I think, when he was the most healthy. But he took like a hundred supplements a day, and but he, I, you know, I think that was when he was really feeling the best. And that was way later. That was. Um, that was about when he was actually I think is that when he was eighteen or nineteen? Yeah. Okay. So he but he was living at home with you during this whole time through high school. He was, but at okay. one point um, things got really bad at home, and he became really defiant and. He just wouldn't follow the rules of the house. And there was um, his sister. He was having a really hard time um, with him. And he he, he got, at one point, he got very uncontrollable. Like, he just wouldn't listen and he wouldn't get out. You know, he wouldn't, like, get out of a room when you asked him to and he wouldn't off and so forth, and eventually um, we ended up having him go to a, um, a wilderness camp um, because mm. things got so bad. Wow. So he actually got um, picked up and um, sent to wilderness, which was extremely hard on me. I um, bet. It was, you know, the hardest decision to have to make um, right. and it was a, it was equally hard on him but it, it was also something so he um, he got so focused on his looks that he he couldn't um, just like he would he decided he didn't like his eyebrows being lighter than his hair. So he would put mascara on his eyebrows, and then we would say, why are you doing that? And he would say, I don't, I, and he, like, wouldn't admit it. So we knew that there was just things that he just had to deal with, and outpatient wasn't working, and everything, you know, it just wasn't, all these things weren't working. Could he, could he hold down a job or anything like that during these, these years? Did he have a... Part-time job, anything, or was he just kind of just going to school and you're just dealing with him at home? Um, when he first went to wilderness, he was um, he was only a junior. Mm-hmm. It was May of junior year, so he was going to school full time. Okay, and then, and in fact. That year, he had transferred from that easy school to a more difficult school, and he had a very good year, his sophomore year, and then his junior year, because he had these ups and downs, his junior year, he decided 
his OCD told him that he was going to have the highest GPA of anybody in the school. So he went from having a very normal schedule his sophomore year and doing quite well and, and, and swimming. And then, and then he decided, you know, he was going to take all these AP and honors classes and he loaded his schedule. And before he started the semester, I went into the, his guidance counselor and they said, you know, he has OCD. He wants to have the highest EPA in the school and he, he's not going to be able to do this. His anxiety is going to go through the roof and it's going to be a disaster. And his counselor said, oh, no, it's okay. He can do it. And I'm like, no. <laughs> they wouldn't. I said, can you please talk him out of it? And they, they, they couldn't do it. They didn't talk him out of it. So that was his junior year. And as soon as things, the pressure got too hard, he started to do that thing where if he had a test, he would refuse to get out of bed and he refused to go to school and he would just freeze. And because if he didn't get it, if he didn't get an A, it wasn't worth doing anything. You know? Right. It was, he was an all or nothing guy. Right. So, so then it was about that same time in the fall of his junior year that, um, he started to smoke pot with um, a friend's older brother, introduced them to pot, the one who went to that school with him. And, um, and then the discovery of that was that it made his anxiety feel better. And that became the beginning of the end of using, um, thinking that pot was the answer to his anxiety and as opposed to drugs. And so back then, pot was, you know, a really bad thing and it was illegal and it wasn't allowed in our house and, you know, and it was so, it became a big to do. And it became, you know, a fight and a this and a that. And, um, and then that was the year in May, finally, that we sent him to wilderness. And he was in wilderness, you know, for whatever it was, 12 weeks or something. And then after that, they recommended that he go to um, a um, therapeutic boarding school. And he went to therapeutic boarding school until Christmas. And then he came home at Christmas time. And he really was much better. And um, he, the whole time he was away, he was super remorseful. He missed everybody and wrote us amazing letters. And he said, you guys are the best parents in the world. I don't, you know, hate you for doing this. I know this is, I was out of control and this is what you had to do. And I love you guys and I'll do anything to be able to stay at home. And so then he came home, and they they actually, in therapeutic boarding school, he was sort of rising through the phases that they have there, and he was doing great. And then all of a sudden they said, you know, we think that he's figured out the system here, and he knows what he needs to do, but we don't feel like he's integrating it emotionally. And so... He's putting on a little bit of a show regarding the, the everything. He's putting on a little bit of a show. Well, he, he they felt like he was telling the counselors and everything what they wanted, wanted to hear. Okay. And they didn't feel like, because he was so clever, mm -hmm. he wasn't real, but he wasn't really able to internalize some of the problems that he was having, one of which was addiction, which at the time didn't seem like it was used, so he hadn't really dealt with it very well. But, so at the last minute they said he's not ready to come home. And it was too hard for him and for us to switch gears and then not bring him home. Because we were all, you know, prepared to bring him home and so forth. We missed him, he missed us, and 
they said he was ready, and then they said he wasn't. And my husband was, you know, we were working out a million dollars that we didn't have. And so we just wanted to see if, you know, he's our son, we were going to figure it, you know, we were going to figure out if he was ready to be home on our own. So he came home at Christmas, and he'd been gone, you know, since May. So, um, so he came home, and he was doing great. And he was doing great for several months until he started smoking pot again. And then we had him in an outpatient situation, and then, um, and then he was doing all kinds of things, you know, like mm, having his sister do the urine test for him and that kind of oh thing. Oh boy! And um, so she went along with did she went along with that, Gina? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, th- I don't mean to the, to be humorous about it, but she would. I know you didn't probably didn't know, but she went along with it. Um, I think she did at one point. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. I don't know. Uh, we didn't know at the time. Right. You know, we always find these things out a little. And we mm. were very vigilant. By the way. I, I believe it. It sounds like you were. It's just, it. this sounds, uh, you know, the listeners, you know, you've been talking about this. And I'm sure, I'll, you know, we, we do talk about mental issues. And we have talked about OCD and things like this, uh, you know, many times on the program. Uh, this does seem to me, at least in Unfound's world, seem to be one of the more extreme cases of, you know, how you dealt with this for several years, doing what you could, being very vigilant, doing the best you could, but doesn't sound like, a, you know, except for this, just this last part that you mentioned, doesn't sound like a lot was working. Well, he did have some really good years. I mean, mm-hmm. sophomore year, he, okay. he got great grades. He was great grades, and he was on the swim team. And, um, you know, he had maintained some friendships. We had uh, brought a foster child into our home who we thought was a really good example. And um, they became good friends. And um, we, you know... So there were, you know, there are there were some um, successful times too, um, but you know, especially difficult was the beginning of his freshman year, and then junior year was really really difficult. And then um, what happened was. Um, let me see if I can remember the turn of events. Um, so, um, I think, was it June? I can't remember. Anyway, we ended up, um, So oh, his senior year, he um, he ended up going. Um, oh, when because he came back in December and he couldn't go back to the same school again. So his senior year, he ended up going to the public school. After all, the one he would have gone to in the beginning. You know, I always thought, well, maybe he could have gone there in the first place. But um, he ended up going to the public school, and then, um, and that's when the um, that's when the drug thing started getting bad. Was in the spring of senior year. Okay. And um, I, I'm trying to remember. We we sent him to a rehab. Uh, center right after his um, his graduation. It was awful. Um, but what happened was he went on a um, a college trip with um, with his dad to LA to go look at colleges. 
and um, he went to visit my husband's father, who had just had surgery, and um, the doctors had given him um, some painkillers, you know, something super strong, like, something super strong. Okay. And uh, the grandfather uh, was saying, oh, my God, I can't, he had never taken, you know, many pills before, said, you know, these pills are crazy. I, I took these pills for the pain, and I started seeing all these colors and blah, 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 blah. And he said this right in front of Jackson. And so my dad uh, went down with his, his father to help him with groceries, and Jackson must have um, pocketed some of those oh my. oh, my. And then that night, my husband and him were staying in a hotel, and um, and they had an appointment to go to the second college the next day. And um, he had taken, like, a whole bunch of these pills, and he had called his ex-girlfriend who lived down there, the one I moved, and it said, oh, I took, you know, 16 of these pills, but I don't feel anything. You know, I think I'm going to take some more. Oh, my. So he didn't feel anything, you know, and I think he was trying to get high, but because he wasn't allowed to have any pot or anything, but, you know, thought about all these pills sounded cool. So he, then he didn't, you know how when you, when you don't feel anything, you think, oh, I'll have another drink or something. But then, and then it all hits you at once. Well, he did that three times until he had something like 31 of these in his system. Oh, my gosh. And when my husband went to wake him up oh that my. morning, he was blue. So he ended up almost dying. And luckily, the hospital was across the street, and they got him in there, and um, my husband called and told me he was in a coma, and so... Um, when was this? If you could give the, the month and year of this, when was this? What month and year? Can you, even get, can you give a guess? This was June uh, 2008. Okay. Wow. So... Um, so I got the number of his ex-girlfriend and I called him and I, I said, did Jackson call you last night? And she said, and you know what he, if he took anything and she, I said, I need to know right away. And she immediately said, yes, <laughs> he said he took X, Y, Z and, um, that he got from his grandpa. So I called my dad, and they immediately gave him the antidote for that drug, and it saved him. And uh, I went to, we went I went down to visit him. He had a tube in his throat, and he couldn't talk. And he wrote, "I will never do drugs again." And um, you know, we thought that was the end of it. And then, like. A week later, he was smoking pot. So that's when we made the decision he had to go to rehab because he was about to turn 18. He turned 18 on June 19th. And so the day that, and we knew once he was 18, we had no control over him. Yeah. So we did the same thing again. We had him picked up in the middle of the night right after graduation. And... Um, and sent him to rehab. And he was there from the middle of June of his, for his 18th birthday until the fall um, when he was 18, when um, in November he was doing some community service and he um, left the program in Phoenix. So, um, and that was when we... They had the program really, I, we didn't like for various, various reasons. One was that they put him on all these different drugs and, you know, a medication. And they, and 
and they wouldn't tell us that they were and blah, 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 blah. So when he came home, we put him on all just the supplements, no more drugs. And that was when he really did the best. And uh, he was, and so he, um, he, he did really well for a, for a long time. And um, he went to the community college and he got a job as lifeguard. And he was lifeguarding at Stanford and lifeguarding at the Y. And um, he was coaching at the swim club. So he was holding out down a job. And then, um, and then this thing happened is uh, after he turned 19 in the fall, he was still going to this psychiatrist, that, the one who, who had given him Lexapro, and we had gotten him back with him. And um, he was still on this, still had this idea that um, this was when medical marijuana started becoming popular. Okay. And he had this idea that he should go on medical marijuana. And, we, and I said, no, as long as you're living here, you can't. So um, then the psychiatrist told him, well, you know, oh, I know, this, that's how he got on the kick without the medical marijuana, but the psychiatrist gave him this idea uh, that since you, you know, don't think the medicines are working for you and you think that marijuana is going to be better for you, why don't you go to Humboldt University and um, and do your medical marijuana thing and live away from home where your parents don't have to, you know, you don't have to abide by the rules not being able to do it there and see if it works for you. So he got the, that idea and he convinced his father to let him do the medical marijuana thing against my will. Mm-hmm. And, um, I bet. And then... Um, so we had this very strict contract with him, and uh, he needed to get a certain GPA at the community college. He needed to hold down his job. He needed to go to counseling. We had various different therapies that he was doing. Um, he needed to, have, you know, basically social life and all these different aspects of his life he needed to keep. And we had a big chart, and he had to do it all. And he had to keep this, the lowest dose possible and not increase it, which he did. And um, and so he did everything in the contract, and he was actually doing quite well, um, much to my chagrin because I did not want him to be doing it. And um, then while he was going to, um, to the community college, he decided in when the semester ended so uh, they were in quarters so it was like April he decided that he wasn't at the top of his game so you remember that Jackson always had to be perfect and he always had to be doing the best imaginable and he decided that the marijuana was affecting his you know memory or whatever and he just wasn't as good as he could be so he decided he was also taking this pill called Klonopin, and he was going to a different psychiatrist because I was so mad at that other woman. He told him to go to Humboldt and do the marijuana when he knew he was, you know, addicted. Yes. So I said, for, yeah, I was furious at him. So, <coughs> psychiatrist. so um, this guy had him, Jackson got him to switch his medicine to this thing called Klonopin, which was probably the beginning of the end because clonopin is extremely difficult to get off of. And just Jackson decided, I don't want the clonopin anymore. This is the spring of his night when he's 19. And uh, he's going to college. He's doing all these things. And he decides, I'm not at the top of my game. I'm going to quit smoking marijuana um, after the three-month trial. And I'm going to quit using clonopin. 
So he starts titrating off the clonopin, and his anxiety goes through the roof, which if you've heard any commercial for any of those pills, it says, you know, do mm-hmm. not you know, stop taking this medication without supervision from your doctor, you know, because suicidal thoughts can happen and da 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 So he, his anxiety goes crazy, and so he can't, he decides to quit his lifeguarding job for a, a certain time period and not go to school that quarter until he can get through this period where he's He's not using pot and he's not, you know, this anxiety that he's having. So he, this is the, the month before he left. Mm-hmm. And he's, um, he's sleep deprived because he's got such high anxiety he can't sleep. So I'm trying to help him with, he's taking, he's going to mindfulness classes. I signed him up for that, and the mind, you know, I'm helping him through these mindfulness exercises, trying to envision your happy place. And his happy place, he said, was the backyard that I newly landscaped for him. And he said, that's the happiest place I can be is in my backyard with this beautiful garden that you made for us, Mom. And so that's how I know he doesn't want to be away from home. I mean, the few days before he left, he told me his happy place was our, you know, right. backyard. Right. And um, and so, you know, we were super close. I was helping him try to sleep. I wanted, I tried every minute of every day to get him to go back to the psychiatrist and talk through this and get some help. And he kept saying, wait, wait, I can do this on my own. Da, 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 da. And it just, it was like this whirlwind spiral that when I think about it now it just seemed like it went by so fast and I and I saw this happening and I couldn't get him to get to help I was worried I'd get him in the car and he'd jump out of the car and I you know tried to help him and I couldn't and um, it was my 50th birthday and my friends uh, were having a party for me So they all came over. We were doing this little triathlon, and they all came over. We were going swimming, and and, uh, they all saw Jackson, and they told me, oh, he looks great. And I said, no, no, he's really not doing well. Mm -hmm. He's really awful, and I can't figure out how to help him. And that was the night before he left. And he, um, one of my girlfriends who was, you know, um, celebrating my birthday with me. Her son was his best friend. So she said, Jason, you know, get Jackson out of the house, you know. And he's not, you know, he needs some buddies to hang out with. So this buddy was not such a great buddy in at that moment because he was totally into drinking and girls and so forth. And Jackson was in an anxiety fit where he didn't want anyone to see him. And he and his other friend convinced Jackson to drive them, to be the designated driver, because since he wasn't, you know, doing any drinking or smoking or anything, to take him to some under under 21 club in San Jose and drive him there. And they wanted him to come in and meet some girls. But Jackson was having this, you know, anxiety fit. And yeah. He didn't want anyone to see him. And so they just didn't get it. You know, everything was a big party for them. It brought alcohol in the car, which got Jackson super nervous. He was like, don't bring anything in my car. You know, he was trying to be good. And they were, you know, steering him in the wrong direction. And um, so he ended up leaving them there when they wanted him to come in. He said, he just said, I'm going home. So he left them there, and I came home from our dinner party, and all of a sudden Jackson arrives, and I'm like, why are you home so early? And he says, oh, those guys are awful, and never again. I'm never going to go out with those guys again. Well, you had to be ha- we had to be happy about that. Well, I didn't, I mean, I didn't know what they had done. Mm, okay. You know, um, and, you know, really, this one boy was one of his best friends, you know, and I... And I knew he was, like, into drinking and so forth, so that wasn't good. But, 
I, you know, I wanted him to have a friend, but I, but then when I found out, you know, he said, you know, they brought alcohol in the car and da 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 da, and I'm like, oh no. Yeah. So he he went off to his room and he was really upset. And you know, I had just been at a dinner party celebrating my 50th birthday, so I was really sleepy. So I went to bed and I said, oh, I'm going to talk to him in the morning. So then the next morning, he just seemed really despondent. And this is the day he disappeared? And this is the day he disappeared? This was the day he disappeared. Before we actually get into the day that Jackson disappeared and everything that went on there, I think we need to talk about uh, a guy that you had mentioned. Um, New Jackson, not sure exactly um you know what's going to come up with him and whether he had anything to do with Jackson's disappearance at all but in our prior conversations Gina um you had mentioned him and I, I think he's worthy of talking about his name is John Majewski what can you tell uh the listeners about him as much as you know how Jackson might have met him how long they knew each other etc Okay. Um, so Jackson was attending the community college down the street, and um, he, you know he was taking classes, and he had several uh, close friends uh, over the years that we knew really well. That when he started going to the community college, he started to meet you know people outside of the you know, the circle of people that we knew and, um, you know, which stands to reason. And uh, there's several several hundred thousand people that go to that community college. So um, one of the fellows that he started to talk about um, was this guy, John, who he said um, very admiringly, he's really incredible because he um, – he gets these jobs and he does all of these different things and it's amazing that he um, he can do all these things. And he said, like, for example, he went to, <clears throat> I can't, this was a long time ago, so 10 years ago we had this conversation, yeah. so I might not have this completely just correct. Give us, but just give us a flavor of who John Majewski was, yes, please. So he said something like, oh, like, he went to San Francisco, and he started doing tours of San Francisco. And he became this, you know, this tour guide while he's, you know, going to community college, you know. And he's a, a guy in his, you know, late teens, early, you know, like maybe 20 uh, at the most. And, um, and here he was, you know, already had this very interesting job to Jackson that was, you know, like he was able to get these jobs without experience that, you know, Jackson was impressed with. And he also said something like he speaks all these languages and he's from South Africa huh. and he lived in some other country and, you know, just kind of pretty amazing thing. So, you know, we're listening, we're like, wow, that's pretty incredible. And, you know, uh, we didn't have any reason to doubt any of it. And um, and so, the, uh, so then when he brought him over one day and we met him, and he did have kind of a South African accent. And um, we're like, oh, okay. And, uh, and he was sort of, you know, very confident and kind of seemed like, you know, maybe to be sort of a ladies' man sort of thing, that kind of thing. But anyway, um, he only came over, you know, a couple times at the most over the course of a month, um, one or two times. And, uh, you know, so he wasn't a close friend or anything. He was more of an acquaintance, that kind of thing. And then the week before Jackson left, when he was having, you know, this difficulty sleeping and extreme anxiety from, you know, going cold turkey off of his medication, mm -hmm. 
the clonopin and going not using any uh, marijuana to ease his anxiety. And so, uh, you know, I was he was kind of having some hard times. And at, at one point during the day, I think it was like the Wednesday before um, before he left on Saturday, um, John came over. And um, Jackson was outside on the patio. And I was upstairs working at my desk. And so I happened in, you know, so it was, a warm day, the windows were open, so I happened to hear them, you know, talking on the patio, you know, and I, I was, you know, concerned about Jackson, you know, because of, you know, how, how much trouble he was having, yeah. um, you know, just getting, you know, getting through the day and so forth, and, you know, I was kind of glad to see him socializing, that was a good thing, right, because, and he was, you know, uh, not so anxious that he couldn't, you know, have a, a nice conversation with one of his friends. So uh, while they were outside, um, I went to the bedroom that was just above the patio. So I was on the second floor, and I just looked down to kind of see who was visiting and who Jackson was talking to. And um, and then at that point, um, John. Jack, I think Jackson was handing something to John, like, I don't know, a piece of paper or a, maybe a piece of money, or, you know, bill or something. He was handing him something, maybe a business card. I don't know what it was. Handing something to John, and John looked at it, put it in his wallet, and said something to the effect, oh, I think this will work. And, uh... And so he put it away, and then he goes, okay, got to run, blah, 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 talk to you later. And then he left. So um, so I was curious, you know, what were they talking about? So uh, I went down, and I talked to Jackson, and I asked him, you know, so, you know, what were you guys, you know, talking about? And um, he said, uh, I think, I think on that day, I said, I, I heard him say something like, I think this will work. And um, Jackson said, uh, it might have been a few days later, I'm not sure, but the story I got from Jackson was um, that John wanted um, to sell one of his Klonopins or something. And Jackson gave him one to sell, something to that effect. Okay. And you know he knew some, something like that, and he knew that that would make me extremely angry. There was big, there was big uh, rules about not doing that. Blah 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 blah. But you know he thought he was, you know, he was telling me this, you know, because that was the story he gave me. So then the strange thing about that was that um, after Jackson left, so that was the last person that Jackson talked to before he left. It might, might have been more like Thursday, because it was Thursday or Friday, because it was very close to, you know, just a couple of days before he left. Okay. So it was, because I know it was, he was the last friend who came by, other than the two good friends he went out with the night before. So it was kind of the last person he talked to. So when Jackson left and we were looking for him around Cupertino on Sunday, uh, he left on Saturday evening, mm -hmm. um, I called this John Matuski. And, you know, I didn't, so I didn't know much about him, but I, you know, I was super worried. And, um, I finally got a hold of him, and, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, sorry, I didn't answer the phone right away. I was, I don't know, he, he said something like he had this car accident, and he was always full of all these crazy stories. He was, I don't know, on this windy road, and 
car flipped over and da 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 and then this happened, da da. But anyway, sorry I didn't get back to him. I said, well, I'm looking for Jackson. Do you know, you know, anything about where he could be? I'm super worried. I think something's happened, da 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 da. What, you know, tell me anything you know about where he could be. And he said, oh, you know, I really, I don't know anything. And I said, well, you know, um, when you came over, I was upstairs and I heard you say, uh, I think this will work. And I just wondered what it was you guys were talking about, because that might, you know, help me figure out where he is. And he said, um, oh, well, you see, I, um, I go to these great parties, and I know a lot of girls. And I really think that Jackson, you know, he's such a great guy and he's so good looking and so forth. And I really wanted to introduce him to some of my, you know, friends that are girls. And so I was going to have him come to this party. And, um, you know, I wanted, and you know, and I wanted to kind of set him up. And I thought, oh, okay, this would work. You know, I was, he, would, he would come to this party I was going to have on blah, 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 or whatever it was. And I was going to introduce him to these great girls I know. And I was like, really? Are you sure you're telling me the truth? Because, mm -hmm. you know, Jackson told me a totally different story. So in my experience with kids at that point, if you get two different stories about the same event, it means that one or both of them are lying. So, um, you know, and that very well could have been both of them or it could have been just one of them. But it was clear that one or both of them was lying because it was yeah. two totally different stories about what that meant. Yeah, for sure. So I never really, I never really did find out um, about that. And um, something interesting happened later on. I, I, somehow I found out that a pretty good friend of mine is very good friends with this John's parents. And um, and she, she was calling me about Jackson. She felt so bad and da-da-da-da. She was helping me look for him, doing things like that. And then somehow I happened to mention the last person that Jackson saw was this John, John Majewski or something from South Africa. So she said, okay, I grew up with John since he was a baby because we are very close with his parents. And something you should know about him is he's not from South Africa. He's from right down the street from you in Cupertino. Oh, my. He's as American as apple pie. His, I know this for sure because I knew his parents when they were pregnant with him. And, you know, I've known him since he was born, basically. And it was just kind of a coincidence that I found, happened to find out that she knew this person. Um, so, so she told me um, another thing is that um, it was clear to her that, in her terms, he he was a pathological liar, and that he was known to have lied a lot about things and doesn't even really realize that he's lying about it, and like all of these stories and stuff were all fabricated. And I have to say that that's classic of Jackson is that he was super gullible and he would believe anything anybody said. So, you know, the fact that Jackson believed all those things is as much about Jackson's character as it was about how good of a liar he was. You know, it, it could have been somewhere in the middle. So, um, so Jackson believed all these things that actually weren't true, and he was all impressed with this guy. But it turns out, you know, he was just a kid down the street. He went, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and he had he he was he actually when I think about it, he was several years older than Jackson. So he had um, kind of been a, a, in and out of school, and he had had his own issues. And and according to this friend of mine, um, you know, his parents were a bit. Um, in denial about, you know, the issues that he had. They were trying to help him um, kind of get on a, a good track. But um, wow. in in her mind, you know, he, he was a bit lost in terms of 
I don't know whether it was, you know, drugs, mental health, combination of those things, um, you know, just being able to, I don't know, you know, not lie and just, you know, kind of live a normal um, 20, 21-year-old life. So um, that's who, that's who he was. Okay, let me ask so, you. Uh, um, let me ask you one question about that. Uh, how did you? Um, we're going. We'll talk about John uh, later uh, once we get into the details. After we talk about the details of Jackson's uh, disappearance uh, that day, but uh, how did you happen to have um, John's phone number to even call him? And is the reason you called him because he had just been over there a couple days before? happened to have his number probably from Jackson's phone and Jackson's well I guess I didn't have his phone yet maybe I didn't call him until I got the car and then which is okay. when I got the phone but um, I mean I I had access to all to Jackson's computer right and, you know anything in his room so somehow I found his number Okay. And you know, I, I was, I was kind of suspicious about him because, you know, he was very different. I didn't know him from Adam. He just kind of came out of nowhere. The stories about him were kind of off. You know, yeah. <laughs> they were kind of weird. And you know, he had said that weird thing to him. This might have worked, which sounded kind of like, you know, I think this will work. You know, right before he would left, which you know, kind of talked about something in the future, and then he's gone. So, you know, it just made me curious what what in the world they were talking about. And honestly, I called anybody that Jackson had been in contact with that week because I was frantic to find out where the where he was. You know, and yeah. I just I was just finding any clue I could find. You know, following any and every clue that there was. Okay. All right, thank you. Doing All right. it as fast as I could. All right, thank you for that. Now let's move on to um, that day that Jackson disappeared. You've already talked about, uh, you know, getting up that morning. Uh, please detail f uh, that day for the listeners as far as, um, you know, what you did, what Jackson told you, and where he said he was going, et cetera. Okay. Um. So that day was after he had gone out with his friends, and he was upset that they, you know, made him go to the, this um, under-21 um, kind of bar and try and meet girls and stuff when he was feeling so anxious. So he was mad at his two good friends, and he woke up, and um, he seemed despondent to me. He didn't seem interested in much of anything. Um, his father asked, you know, said, let's go take the dog for a walk, and they walked around the block, and his father talked to him about whether he wanted to get a puppy to replace his dog that he loved, who had died in January. And, uh, you know, we had waited a couple months. And so he thought, you know, anything would get him excited that would be it. And Jackson told his father, no, that's okay. You know, he just didn't sound that interested. So that was like a clear sign that he just, you know, was really feeling hopeless, you know, and just just not feeling well. Okay. And, um, and I was always uh, on the, um, always trying to get him to get outside and, and do something outside, get some vitamin D, exercise. He was um, always a very athletic guy, so not getting outside and doing things was, you know, not a good state for him, and I thought it would help with the anxiety. So I tried to get him to go swimming with me at our club across the street, and uh, he said, no, Ma, you go. You know, I don't really feel like swimming. So, um, so my friend 
had wanted to meet me across the street at the pool and go swimming. So uh, we had all been home all day. And then this was at about 2.30 or 3 or something like that. And so I said, you know, I, I try, he was sitting there reading a book at his desk. And uh, so he told me to go. And I left. And so I would be gone about an hour for the swim. And as soon as I left, he went in and asked his dad for the keys to the car. And he said, um, there's an AA meeting I want to go to. Um, and I have the keys to the car. And typically, if he wanted to go, you know, something like that, that was fine. But the weird thing is, we, so he, he kind of knows that I'm a little more vigilant about things than his dad, you know, that his dad just, you know, doesn't, you know, he's like, okay, you want the key? Sure, here's the key. But um, I happen to know that all of those AA meetings are either in the morning, around noontime, or in the evening. But that was like a really odd time for a meeting. Yeah. And um, so there, so he asked for the keys to the car. And he got the keys, and he left. And then I came from home from the swim, and I said, where's Jackson? And Paul said, he, um, he wanted the keys to go to a, a meeting. And I go, a meeting? There's no meeting around this time. And he was like, yeah, he said it was over here, and da, da, da. And so... You know, I asked about it, and he's like, he was in a hurry because he wanted to get there on time. Okay, that's really weird. And that kind of sat with me funny, and I didn't really look into it right away. But later, when I did look into it, of course, there was no meeting at that place at that time. So, um, I, should, I need to, I need to jump in here, Gina. Was Jackson going to AA meetings? Was that something he had been doing for a while, or was that something new? Well, you know, as I said, he, you know, was addicted to marijuana. Yeah. And he was, you know, dependent on it. And he was, you know, he had off and on over the course of a couple of years, gone to AMA meetings and stopped and started. There wasn't one that really fit him very well because he was younger than the people. He didn't have an alcohol issue. A lot of them had alcohol issues or right. harder drug issues. So, you know, and a lot of them felt like, you know, addiction to marijuana wasn't really a real addiction. So, you know, in a lot of ways, he didn't really. He also, you know, they try and find their higher power and he couldn't find his higher power. So he would get into it and then he would. So, yes, it was something that he did on, on and off. Okay. And there was some people that he did become friends with, and they went to this, there's this young people's group, and they went on a trip to L.A., and they danced all night, and there was no, you know, drugs or alcohol or anything. And they kind of found a, a group for a little bit that was working. So, you know, we were we were happy when he did it, and we felt like, you know, that was a good thing. Okay. Um, so... You know, so that's why his father said, you know, sure, if you want to go, go. But there was no meeting. And so then we had an event. Uh, it was like a barbecue kind of thing at this club across the street, the pool and tennis club. And we were all going to go. Kind of a, a, you know, our family often did things uh, over there. It's just this casual place. And so, you know, we, I showered after my swim. We put on some clothes, we got the, our daughter, we, you know, and we're like, well, you know, we, we kept calling Jackson, we didn't get any response, so, he, and he, he was at this period where we figured he wasn't going to want to go anyway, so we left him a note, we said we went to the club, and, uh, and we figured he wouldn't want to go, so we went over there, but, you know, we were, you know, we were kind of worried that it had been now a couple hours. Yeah. And he hadn't come back yet. Of course. So, um, but, you know, 
typically there wasn't anything to worry about. You know, usually we go to the meeting. And usually what they do is they hang out for a while. And they talk. Sometimes they went for coffee or whatever. So a couple hours wouldn't be that abnormal. But we came home from the thing early. And we were like, okay, what are we going to do? He's not here. He's not answering. And he's in so your and he's in your car worried. and he's in your car. Yeah, he's right. in our car. Right. And we can't find any sort of sign of any you know any anything else about any clues to where he went. And I think we probably called all his friends and said, "Do you know where he is? Do you know where he is?" We called around, called everyone we, that he knew that we knew, and nobody knew where Jackson was. So we called the police, and we reported him missing. So um, they came over, and um, they were extremely unhelpful. Right. So it turns out there's there's actually a protocol that when you when there's somebody under 21 who is missing, you are supposed to go in their bedroom and you're supposed to secure all of their their computer and all of their uh, phone and everything and take it and analyze it right away and you're supposed to immediately report them to um, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Well, they didn't do anything like that. What they told me was he was probably out having a good time. Yeah. And I tried to explain that you don't understand he was in a very bad you know, mood, he was despondent, he was depressed, he was not himself that day, and um, where, you know, he didn't have a good time last night, and we're pretty, you know, we're positive he's not ha having a good time tonight. Um, we're worried, you know, that something's happened. And um, and so they said, oh, okay, we'll, we'll look for him. But, um, you know, but they, they didn't it wasn't a high priority. He was a one month shy of 20 years old. Yeah. So he was 19, and he was male. And I don't know. They just didn't think yep. he was a high risk to worry about. You know, they had bigger fish to fry. Did they? When so, you uh, let them know, did they actually come to the house, or did you just talk to them on the phone? The police? No, they came to the house and took a report. Okay. And we sat in the living room and talked about it. All right. And they asked. Um, okay. and, uh, and then, um, so obviously, so we couldn't, you know, we could do a lot of calling around and we did some driving around, but since it was dark, there wasn't, mm -hmm. there weren't a lot of places we could really look for him. And we thought he was, you know, close by. Um, we, you know, we, we did a lot of brainstorming. We did a lot of searching and calling, but, you know, we, we didn't find him. So I basically was up all night. And then the next morning, Sunday morning, um, you know, as soon as it was light out, we got up, you know, I don't know, it was like 5 in the morning or something. And we went searching for him. And first we went to the church and we prayed and everything and then we headed up like mountainous roads to see if maybe he had gone to the top. I don't know why I was thinking, you know, maybe he went to the top of the road and he was thinking about things or something and we drove all over the place and we called and we got lots and lots of people got concerned and they were all looking, all of our friends were all looking all over Cupertino and nobody could find him anywhere. Mm. And, uh, we also started playing with his computer, trying to figure out any signs of his computer, any notes, any files, any emails, and so forth. And we had a really hard time finding anything on his computer. And we actually kind of messed things up because it turns out that when you do forensics on a computer, you don't want to have any keystrokes. Um, that you make that he didn't make before you start analyzing the drive. But, you know, we'd never done this before, so we didn't know. Right. But the police should have known. So then early Monday morning, my husband 
called his IT guy at work, and um, his ID, IT guy said, you know, he would come right over and analyze the computer. So he came over, and he found some, you know, you can find files that have deleted, some deleted files. Mm -hmm. And he found um, something that was a Google map to the um, Golden Gate Bridge. Huh. So that scared the life out of us. Right. So we immediately called the Golden Gate Bridge um, parking. Oh, we called the police. I guess we called our the peop the police the sergeant who came over. Um. Anyway, at the very same time that we figured out that he probably went to the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, the um, the parking lot place called us, mm -hmm. and it turns out that he had parked his car in what on the weekend is public parking, but on Monday morning it's employee parking. So um, there was his car still parked there on Monday morning. So they found, you know, so they reported the license plate or something and found out that it was ours, and they said, do you know that your car is parked um, at the Golden Gate Bridge? Let me, uh, let me ask you this, if I could just jump in here once again for a few mo moments, Gina. You live in Cupertino, California. <coughs> right. You live in Cupertino, California. How far is that from San Francisco? 45-minute drive. Okay. And to your knowledge, had Jackson ever – driven there before? Uh, I mean, when do you think the last time was no. that he was ever in San Francisco? Was he ever there? Oh, yeah. He had gone with us to San Francisco, but he had never driven there by himself. Okay. Okay. And I just want to make something else uh, clear. When he disappeared, so he's missing, the car is missing, did he take his wallet and phone with him, or did he leave those things behind? He took his wallet and his phone with him. Okay. And um, he uh, was – so he wore a couple of rings, a couple of silver rings, mm -hmm. and a chain – and a little silver chain around mm -hmm. his neck. Okay. And he took, he took those off and left them in his uh, desk, in the top drawer of his desk. Okay. And he typically would wear those every day. Okay. Um, he wasn't wearing – Please. Anything special? He was he was wearing um, kind of long shorts that went mm -hmm. to about you know his knees, and he was wearing these um, shoes that. So Jackson was very um, uh, particular about what he wore. In general, you know, he only wore certain colors, and he always had to look just a certain way that he wanted to look, and. Um, so these shoes were his dad's. They were from Target, and typically he wouldn't be caught, you know, I don't want to say huh. caught dead, but he wouldn't be right. caught with these shoes on. Right. But he happened to be wearing those shoes with no socks um, and these long khaki shorts and then, you know, uh, some sort of a T-shirt and a sweatshirt. So San Francisco is always cold. Uh, so he wasn't typically, but he wasn't dressed very well for San right. Francisco. And I uh, should I should ask when you were trying when you figured out that this AA meeting didn't exist and that Jackson had, he had lied about that and you and others tried to call him knowing that he took his phone, uh, was it going straight to his voicemail or was it ringing? Do you, do you even remember all these years later? It went to voicemail and we left. I, le I remember I left. Mm. I left so many messages right. on that phone. When I finally got the phone, <laughs> all the messages okay. were from me. So I, I, I mean, maybe once again, I realize it's been almost ten years now. But was it going directly to voicemail, or do you think that it rang for a little bit and then went to voicemail? That that could be a you know, a, I guess we could say that'd be the difference between the phone being off when it goes straight to voicemail. And it ringing maybe seven or eight times, and then it going voice to voicemail would mean that the phone was on. He just wasn't picking it up. 
do you remember? I know it's a very technical question, but do you even remember? I don't really remember. Okay. I think that I I remember the feeling uh, that um that it was going straight to voicemail. Voice okay. All right, so th this happens. So this happens on a Saturday. Uh, police come and get there. They don't, of course, they react as most of the time police do when it comes to late teens and adults uh, disappearing. They say, "Oh, don't worry. You know, he or she is going to come back." Uh, that happens very often. And then, um, you know, you get him to his computer, and there's these directions to the Golden Gate Bridge, and then right approximately at the same time the Golden Gate Authority calls you um, because your car is in their parking lot and that you said was approximately a Tuesday so uh, let's talk about so, that so this is please this is Monday morning Monday and I morning. actually found I found the notes in my I found my notes oh. and it said that that this deputy came to our house to provide information they were contacted about the car at at the Golden Gate Bridge okay. also. They were waiting for the San Francisco authorities to call us. The Honda was found with the passenger reading light on and the right rear reading light on. The battery was dead. So hmm. um, I have in parentheses the light could have been on since he drove the car on Friday night um, or he went back to the car at night, like he left the car right. in the parking lot and then went back to it at okay. night. Or it could have been from Friday night when he went out with his friends because it was the same night, uh, the same car. Although okay. if it had been on when he went out with his friends, it you would think it might have been battery dead on Saturday, but it wasn't. Okay. You know, it's interesting you uh, uh, say that. I don't. You know, a, a, a reading light or something in a car, I just wonder if it would drain a battery. You know, that doesn't use up a lot. You know, and it, of course, a car battery is very heavy duty. Some light like that, you know, how long would it take to wear a battery out? That's very interesting to me. But So the battery was dead in the car. Yeah, the battery okay. was dead, and there were two okay. reading lights on, okay. one in the front and one in the back. Okay. Um, anything else unusual? Those those sounds like unusual things to me, but maybe not. Like you said, there might be a perfectly logical explanation explanation for those uh, lights being on. Anything else though that comes to mind that was unusual about the car? Um, he left his phone and his wallet okay. in the car. Okay. He left, um, and I. So I, he might have had – so back then, your phone didn't have music. Um, so I right. think he might have also had something like an iPod or something. Okay, sure. Yes. In so the days he, before he Spotify. And was. So he was very into music. So if he were going to go somewhere for a while, he would – he, he would take his iPod with him so he had music with him. So right. he, and he also, so you know when you get a parking ticket um, for, a, for a parking lot, the change comes out as quarters. So he had gotten a bunch of quarters from the, cha from the parking. So they have him on tape going to get a, a parking ticket. Um, putting it on the dash, and he also put all the change from the um, machine in the car. So he literally had no money with him when he left the car. When he left the car. Because he left a bunch of quarters, and he left his wallet, and he left all his possessions. Okay, well, that, that brings me uh, to the next point. They find the car. Of course, there are these uh, things about it, the lights, the, the money, the, the, the wallet. Uh, the phone, but you just mentioned that there is actually video of Jackson and uh, of him in that parking lot, seemingly, I guess, when he pulled in there. Uh, does the video show him pulling in there sometime 
on Saturday. I mean, yeah, have you so seen have you seen the video? Tell the listeners about that video. No, so they wouldn't let us see the video. They this wouldn't. is what I wrote in my notes. Okay. Notes, which is probably more accurate than anything. Okay. So we talked to this officer, which is the the only people at the bridge that they let you talk to is the CHP guy, the mm-hmm. California Highway Patrol. They won't let you talk to you know any any other official at all, yeah. um, because uh, you know after nine eleven. Golden Gate Bridge was a target for terrorism. So all of those videos are, like, off limits for anybody. But you also have to understand that it's the most popular place in the world to commit suicide. So yeah. it's kind of a crazy thing. Yes. So um, we talked to this CHP officer at length, and he covers the bridge possible suicide. Um, he gave us his personal cell phone. Jumping at night is difficult because they allow no pedestrians at night, only bikes. Um, There is some type of gate to open by a toll booth operator. So you can't can't get through there if you're a pedestrian. He was was the one allowed to request video review. The first review showed Jackson arriving at 4.09, parking ticket time and walking near the bus stop, and then going out of the camera view. They also said he didn't go through the tunnels to reach the bridge entrance. They concluded he left the bridge area. So the way the bridge works is if you're a pedestrian, the only way to get from the parking lot to the the entrance to the bridge, to go over the bridge, um, to walk over the bridge, is to go underneath, underneath a pedestrian tunnel and then you come out on the other side of the road, because this is a busy road with toll booths and stuff. Mm-hmm. You come out on the other side of the road, and then there's a gate, and you go through the gate, and then you can walk across the bridge. But they close that gate at night, and they said they checked the video camera, and he never went through the pedestrian tunnel. Okay. So they concluded that he left the bridge area from the other side of the road where the parking lot was. Okay. So, um, then we, um, we sent a letter to the district secretary at the Golden Gate to ask to review the tapes of the bridge. Um, uh, a handwritten letter given to the receptionist. It was helpful, blah, blah, blah. Then, um, so then, so these guys were um, totally uh, uh, made the videos inaccessible to us. We were getting nowhere with the with the case. Okay. So we, we went to the other side of the bridge, um, where there's a coast guard station, and um, this coast guard fellow helped us get access to the videos from the north side. And we watched a video. So this, so the videos on the south side are um, professional videos. They're very clear and so forth. The Coast Guard videos are like your handy cam yeah. videos. Super bad um, resolution. You know, you can barely see it. And um, but they do have this, you know, this video set up. So there we sat, and at 4.44 on the video camera, we saw what looked like a splash. So um, we hmm. couldn't see anything fall, falling off the bridge, but it looked like a, but according to one of the officers, it, they said it could have looked like a splash from a jump, but she couldn't, she couldn't confirm it. Right. And, uh, and because there are rocks there, so when the waves come in from under the Golden Gate Bridge, you know it's got a famous current. The waves come in, and when they hit the rocks, the splash goes up. So it could have just been the water splashing the rock and going up, or it could have been somebody jumping off a bridge sure. and falling in and, and then the splash of the body. But no one could confirm either way, but that seemed like very bad news to us. You know, we were in shock and so forth, but then... We gave the time info to the sergeant 
office at the other side of the bridge. And we asked them to, you know, keep reviewing the tape. We saw this, you know, on the on the Coast Guard videotape at 444, and they said there were no um, there were no reports of this. By the way, this was a sunny day at 444 mm-hmm. on May 15th. It was a crystal clear blue sunny day in San Francisco. And if you've ever been to San Francisco on the Golden Gate Bridge, on a sunny day like that, there are thousands of people on the bridge. Yes. Thousands of boats below the bridge. It's just a very happening place, right? It is. And nobody, nobody reported any um, jump. Nobody reported it from the top. No one reported it from underneath. There were no reports. So they kept on saying, he didn't jump. There's no way he jumped. But we saw this flash. So then... um, Let's see, they were clear, they were pretty certain no one jumped on that day, da 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 So then, um, there's, you know, there's, so what happened was we put flyers all, but my friends basically took over with the whole flyering thing. And they, they got somebody to put um, something on the news that night. So the very Monday night on the news, there were pictures of him. There was, you know, information about it. You know, anybody have any information, call, blah, 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 blah. So, um, so, and we called all the hospitals, da, 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 and we did everything. And all the flyers went out. And then on Wednesday, we got a call that um, a woman um, was in her neighborhood, in the Richmond neighborhood with her son. And um, so the the close-knit neighborhood where she pretty much knew most of the people who walk around on the streets, and she saw somebody she didn't recognize. And the person walked by them, and her son was carrying a drawing in his hand. And this person said, hey, nice drawing. And, um, and so, you know, she thought, well, who is this stranger talking to my son? Who is, like, in a stroller or something, you know, a young kid. And, um, so she had seen this person walk into a dry cleaners. And so she went into the dry cleaners and she said, do you know who that guy is? And, and the dry cleaners man said, no, no, he just came in and, I." Uh, he asked me to touch his back. And I said, why, why touch your back? And uh, he, he said, just touch my back. So he touched Jackson's back, and he, you know, and he said thank you, and he left. And then he went by the kid. So the woman said, well, this is too weird. I'm calling the police. So he called the police, and unfortunately, the police came an hour and a half later. Yeah. From like a block away, and mm-hmm. so by the time they came, you know nobody was there. They talked to the dry cleaners guy. They talked to the woman. And that's all they did. So, but then somehow she saw the flyer, and she called us, and she said, "I think I saw your son today." And da da da. And so that's how we got our first two leads: was that woman, and then the dry cleaners guy. And they both said, with over 90%, almost 100%, sure, that they thought, you know, this guy was Jackson. And how, and how, far, is this, them, and how far is this location from where the car was parked? Um, approximately. How long would you take to walk it? Approximately like an hour walk. Maybe. An hour walk. Okay. At okay. the most, yeah. Okay. Yeah, an hour walk. Okay. Not far. I mean, San Francisco isn't that big. You can walk the whole thing in like three hours. Okay. So an hour, a walk away, and but this is uh, at least you said this was like um, what? Wednesday. Uh, how how many? No, this was. What was the day of these sightings? If he disappeared on a Saturday, what was the day of the sightings? These sightings. 
I think the sightings were Tuesday. All right, so like three days later. Okay. Mm-hmm. I want to go back, if we could go back to the videos for a moment. Okay, so you had the videos of the parking lot where the car was found. You had the video from the Coast Guard on the other side of the bridge, which, of course, is a, f- a few miles away. Uh, did you try to get video? Are there any private businesses around there? I'm sure the police, as I, I guess we're getting the feeling here, not taking much of this too seriously, but there were there any other private businesses that you know could have been asked to provide videos, you know, like a bank or something like that, you know, ATM machine, anything like that? Well, not at this time because the videos would have been at the bridge, and there's no businesses that have videos of the bridge other than bridge well, authority. Well, I guess what I'm asking is that if he walked away, I mean, we're. I think what you said is that when he walked away from the car, he wasn't going toward the bridge. He was going somewhere else. And so if he was seen then a few days later, and these sightings are true, uh, did, did you you know, try to get videos from any of those other businesses in the area to see if that actually was Jackson? Oh, so once we got, once we got those two first um, – uh, uh, we, I went to every single business on that street, okay. up and down, and I stopped at every single business. I, I showed them photos. I asked them, that, did they ever see this person, and blah, 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 blah. And I asked them about videos and so forth, and yeah. So we did do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so when I first started doing this, so you got to understand I was, very emotional. <laughs> I'm sure. So I wasn't Absolutely. thinking completely straight. Um, this should have been something that these detectives were doing, but they did zero. Nothing. So, sure. you know, all of a sudden, I needed my crash course in detective yes. work. Yes. Um, so, but I did go to every single place, and I found, I think, two other places that thought they had seen Jackson. One was a coffee shop, and it was the same day. And uh, this woman said that he came in there. And the most amazing thing was that, like, I would ask, what what was he wearing? And they would say, he was wearing, like, these long khaki shorts. You know, and, and it was kind of an unusual outfit, right? And, mm-hmm. and then I said, what was he wearing on his feet? And she said, he was wearing loafers with no socks. Wow. So I was like, you know, so it made me believe that maybe he hadn't jumped off the bridge, you know? Mm-hmm. At first I saw that splash and I thought, oh, my mm-hmm. God, my son jumped off the bridge. Yeah, But of course. then I got all this stuff that, that, that pointed to him being there. And, you know, I still go over this in my mind that, Every, you know, almost every day, I'm and sure think, who were they talking about if it wasn't him? I, you know, it's hard to imagine. But they did, you know, so they described him to a tea. It was this coffee shop. He came in, and he he asked for a glass of water. And so my son um, drinks water. He's not a coffee drinker. So he went into a coffee shop and asked for a glass of water. So, I mean, it, what she was saying, you know, voluntarily sounded like him. And um, and then there was, like, a bowl of fruit. You know how coffee shops will have bananas you can buy? And um, he said, do you, by chance, have, like, a rotten banana or something that you don't um, need, you know, that you can't sell? Um, because he said he was hungry. And um, and she said, you know, sure, have this banana. She gave him a banana. And then um, he he was leaning over and, like, looking at some scratch or bite or um, itchy thing on his calf. And she said, and she was kind of making small talk with him, trying to figure him out. And she said, what happened to your leg? And he said, oh... I got a spider bite or something. And then he said something strange like, but they're not going to get me, something like that. But, I, you know, 
And she said, well, you know, you those can be really dangerous. You should have them looked at, look, have it looked at. You know, maybe you should go, you know, to the um, urgent care and have it yeah. looked at because cytobites can be dangerous. And I think she just kind of wanted to talk to him and make sure he was okay and that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. And that's when he said, no, no, no. I, you know, I'm not going to let them get me or, you know, something like that. Or it's not, or they can't hurt me or something to that effect. Mm-hmm. And then he thanked her and left after having water and banana. So that was one place. And then the other place was like a gas station or something. And we went in there. And this guy thought that um, Jackson had come in. Oh. At the dry cleaners, uh, he, Jackson was mumbling under his breath, no smoking, no smoking. So um, that's what he was mumbling either when he was coming in or going out. So at this gas station, he there was something about a girl. He was like buying cigarettes for a girl or he was with a girl and one of them wanted cigarettes, something about buying cigarettes, and there was some sort of a girl with him. And this guy thought that he looked like Jackson. Mm. So that was that was the fourth place on that street. But this coffee shop and, not, and this uh, gas station, they didn't have video that could prove these things. I'm not trying to be... No. Yeah, I, you know, I uh-uh. just... No, nothing like that. Uh-uh. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, being that they seem to, some of these people seem to get what he was wearing uh, correct, is there any way that they could, uh, you know, because as I'm sure you know by now, Gina, a lot of um, eyewitness accounts of missing people are not true. That's, that's what the statistics say. Is there any way these people, you know, might have seen something or, you know, seen a news story or seen a flyer? And known what he was wearing, and instead of them knowing, you know, what he was wearing, you know, independently. Is it, you know what I'm saying? Sure. You know, I mean, any anything's possible, except for those first three people hadn't seen the hadn't seen anything about the news until after. Mm-hmm. They, you know, yeah, until afterwards. Especially the woman at the coffee shop didn't know anything about it. Okay. I guess when that's I, what I'm saying is, is that, you know, they said about his shoes, the loafers with the no socks, there, that that piece of information was not out in the public yet when you talked to these people? Um, well, I, not, I don't think that it was out there before. I don't think those people saw that before okay. they talked to me. Okay. Um, but I did. I did put that a picture of the shoes on the flyer that I eventually put up. Mm-hmm. I, all I'm trying to do is but, I'm trying to make but, sure that these that people that I talked to in the cafe had not seen the flyer. Okay. I okay. asked, you know, have you seen the flyer of this missing person? And she said no. Okay. Uh, all I'm trying to get it. Uh, I'm just trying my purse. Me personally, I'm trying to get a good handle. You know, or, you know, did these people just see something from the flyer? You know, and there was, or is this, you know, was a real sighting of somebody with really those shoes on? Is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's all. That's all I'm trying to, you know, trying to determine. That you know, that would certainly be something. Being that he was wearing unique shoes. And then they tell you this, you know, the guy that they ran into was also, you know, no socks with unique shoes. Of course, that would be, you know, something, you know, would be a considerable lead. Uh, I'm just trying to make sure that they weren't, they didn't see the flyer, and then some guy came in there, you know. No, so this woman had not seen the flyer, and okay. I, oh, I, I made it a point to ask open-ended questions, like, okay. what was he wearing? Okay. And I and then I said and then when she said there was he had this thing on his calf, I said, Oh, mm. so did you happen to notice what he was wearing on his feet? 
And then she said, actually, I did because it was unusual that he was wearing no socks with these loafers. Okay. And I said, oh. Okay. Really? And that, so that's like, all of a sudden I was like, wow, this woman, you know, sounds like she saw him. Okay. All right, so we have the, the video of him walking away from the car. We have these sightings of him. Seem promising. Um, his phone was left behind in the car. After he left uh, your house in your car and drove to uh, San Francisco that day, did he make any calls? Did he make any texts? Did he use his phone for any no. reason? No. Okay. Okay, so he was driving. He did that entire drive, not talking to anybody. didn't call any of his friends. They didn't try calling him. He didn't text anybody. It was just him driving and the phone um, being, you know, being with him. Um, anything, you know, in 2010, of course, smartphones had already come out. iPhones were out. Uh, anything, any searches that he could have done on his phone that, that you looked at once you got his phone? Anything unusual about his phone at all? No, he, he, there weren't any smartphones. He had a flip phone. Oh, did he? Oh, he had a flip phone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he just had a little flip phone. With, um, all right. That's why I knew all all of the numbers because right. they basically, he basically had like one through ten options of contacts to put in, and that was about it. Okay. All right. So he had a flip phone uh, at that time. Uh, of course, iPhones came out in 2007. Android phones not long after that, but he in 2010 still had a flip phone. Okay. Um. Wh so you were you were there. You're talking to these people, putting these flyers up. I mean, how long did you stay in that area doing this? Um. And these these sightings that you've you've um recounted here. Uh. Would you say that those were the last sightings, um, possible sightings of Jackson, or were there others after that? Yeah, the, um, there were there were lots of others after that. Oh, uh, where there were, and okay. Some some were some were more believable than others. Mm -hmm. You know, I've come to find out that people are very sympathetic and they want to help, and yeah. so they wish that who they see is him, and, um, you know, and so, and it's very difficult to tell whether it was him or not, because the police don't come fast enough, and because people don't take photos when they see them, and there's never any proof of whether it's him or not. Um, we ended up with a lot of very close but unfortunate um, situations mm -hmm. where we were unable to verify whether it was him or not. So, like, for example, um, we began to, um, we, we got one case where somebody thought they saw him on a public bus, and there are videos on buses yep. and transit videos, and, um, we found the person who's in charge of the videos, and she was extremely difficult, and she refused to get the information. And then we got a private investigator who could request the, the videos, and she made us jump through a million hoops. And in the meantime, we we're like, we're running out of time. These videos get, get taped over, and da 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 and then finally, she got what we wanted. And then we kept getting, so once we found one, we went on all the buses and asked every single bus driver. We went to the bus driving terminal where all the bus drivers left. We asked, we showed pictures to every bus driver in San Francisco. We, you know, has anybody seen this person on your bus? And we ended up getting three instances of people, including a bus driver, uh, two bus drivers, and we ended up having exact time, exact bus numbers, and then she ended up messing up every single one. She got PM instead of AM. She got the wrong bus. We finally got the tapes. They were wrong. And then finally we got one, but it was overwritten. Anyway, a million things went wrong, and, you know, I was just tearing my hair out because 
she was being so unhelpful and we never ended up getting the right tape and the right, you know, information. And, and those were, you know, again, similarly good sightings. Yeah. Those in particular were good. And they were good mostly because there was video and we would have been able to prove it if it was him or not. Yeah. But we never, uh, we, we never succeeded. Absolutely true. And during those searches, you were there and everything, I mean, if we're to believe some of these sightings, I mean, how close would you say that you came to possibly running in? If this was Jackson, how close do you think you came to running into him, being that you did get to talk to some of these people who seemingly saw him? Did you miss him by a day? Did you miss him by several days? What was it? Maybe sometimes it was just a day, a couple of days. Wow. Okay. Well, because, I mean, the sighting we got on, it was, I think I think it was, the, I mean, I have to check my notes, but I think she thought she saw him on Tuesday. We were up there on Wednesday. Okay. So right. we followed up everything, you know, exactly. Yeah. Uh, did you go to any, did you end up going to any homeless camps or anything like that um, to, to check we, them? Yeah, we, so we got, um, so we got giant search teams together. There was a, a religious group that got um, 75 people one day, 75 people the next day, you know, and we made maps of the city, and we combed, you know, the whole city, putting flyers up, talking to everybody. And um, what was the question? Oh, the homeless camp. Mm -hmm. We 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 combed the Golden Gate Park. Um, I spent a lot of time in Golden Gate Park. You know, everybody in the who has a missing person or you know, finds out you have a missing person, they go, well, did you try Golden Gate Park? Yeah. So we looked all, you know, because there's Tippie Hill and there's this part right in Haight-Ashbury and there's a lot of young people who hang out smoking pot, so it seemed like, you know, a logical place to look. I got to know all of the regulars over there. And some were helpful, some were not. But um, we, we guessed. Yeah. We combed all of those areas. Another big area that we checked a lot and we got sightings from is um, there's Market Street and there's an area that's kind of part of the Tenderloin where there's a um, like a methadone clinic and there's a lot of homeless people and there's a lot of um, you know kind of street drugs being sold and a lot of homeless and hanging out and so forth and shoppers, and so you know, we spent a lot of time there. Um, we, I talked to a lot of street people. Some were super helpful. Um, you know, some gave me some insight to what it was like being on the street. One guy ended up calling me and said that he had he had just gone to like a a Goodwill store or something and saw the flyer and he thought that he had spent the evening with Jackson the night before and uh, I was like, oh, really? And so he um, he said he would meet us in the city that evening and show us exactly where they went and tell us all about what he talked about and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. so, we, so I went with my husband and another couple, and the neighbors across the street, the Jackson's best friend's parents. So the, the four of us went up there, you know, just not knowing what was going to happen. Sure. But, um, so we met this fellow, really nice young guy, who he said he was just kind of like a, there's a lot of people who just travel around, you know, and he's, I think he called himself a traveler or something. And uh, he showed us, uh, he said that he met Jackson on the street, and Jackson was carrying some sort of a guitar that was missing strings, and uh, Jackson did play the guitar, and um, and so they, and he showed us where they all walked. We walked all over the city, 
and he told us that um, Jackson was super paranoid um, that people were following him. And so yeah. this is very typical of people who are sleep deprived. Yeah. And he said he said he was really he said he told this fellow he was very good at hiding and very and it, he never stayed in a spot for like more than an hour. And this fellow was telling us how dangerous it was sleeping on the street and that the night before uh, he was sleeping and somebody took all of his stuff and injured him some way, I forget how. So he had gone to urgent care and um, and then and that's how he, he and then he went to this goodwill place and that's how he saw the fire. And he said that Jackson was super nice to him and he was the first nice person he had met on the street. And that um, that the reason he felt like he Jackson felt like he was surviving was because he kept moving, which meant he was never sleeping. And that um, he was really worried because someone gave him some marijuana, some pot, and he was afraid that they put some uh, meth in it. And there was a meth epidemic going on in San Francisco at the time. And Jackson was always scared to death of meth. And he told this guy, you know, that he hated meth and he was, he, that there were these people following him, trying to get him hooked on meth. And I looked into this and it turns out that that was actually a thing. That people, that these young people, that some people were trying to get others hooked on meth in San Francisco at that time. Mm. And... I found, you know, when I researched it, I found that out after this boy had told me this, and that he was kind of, um, so I don't know if this, you know, this could, so a lot of the things that people told me, I I believed or didn't believe based on how reliable I thought the person seemed. Like the woman who owned the cafe, I went back and talked to her a ton of times, and I found her very reliable. This guy, who knows? You know, right. I'm, I'm really did, well, this guy that you know, this young guy that you talked to, did he ever say what happened to you? Know, is, so he saw Jackson, and then Jackson wasn't around. I mean, where, you know, where did he say Jackson could have gone? Did he, um, say, did he say? Oh, so the frustrating thing was we asked him, like, what he talked about, and we asked him all these questions to try and see if there was anything mm-hmm. specific that could – yeah. indicate that it was him, like, did he talk about his sister, or where he was from, or, you know, what his job was, you know, anything, anything that would identify him, what his name was, blah, 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 and he couldn't give us anything that was for sure Jackson. Yeah. He gave us a few things that sounded like Jackson, and uh, if I look through my notes, I could probably find it. But there wasn't anything like he never said the name of his sister or the name of his dog or and he said we said, Well, what did you guys talk about? And he said, Well, you basically we just talked about like the day to day things that was going on on the street, you know. Like he had been here and he had been there and these guys did this to him and he's afraid these guys are following him. We're talking about the day to day and he and they never talked about their history to each other. Okay. So it didn't it didn't give us, you know, any yeah. specific information that we could No. No no, no viable information on where he could have gone after that, you know, and that's what makes those kinds of stories not believable. Uh I have to agree with you. If if any of these sightings was Jackson, I think you'd be more inclined to believe the the mother, uh, you know, and the and the dry cleaner people more than anybody else. Um, okay, so we have these stories. Maybe Jackson, maybe not. He's hanging air. It seems around in the in the the San Francisco area. There's no signs that uh, he ever did walk onto the bridge. I mean, in fact, he went in the opposite direction. Um, you had talked about John Majewski, of course, before we started this section of uh, this interview, um, did he offer up any help, being that he just saw, you of course learned that he was eventually a fraud and everything else, could he offer up any 
uh, help at all regarding Jackson's disappearance about any reason that Jackson would have gone to San Francisco? No. None. Did is, is he was friends with Jackson? Did he try to help search for him at all? No. Okay. All right. And uh, does John Majewski live anywhere near San Francisco? Now? Uh, no, at the time. I don't. I... Any at the time? Mm, no, I think he. I think he lived near Cupertino or in okay. Cupertino, somewhere okay. around there. All right, and we have to remember that with this video from the parking lot, that Jackson was by himself. There are, are no signs that he was with anybody. However, um, considering going back to the video for a moment, is there a chance that, you know, there's this video of him leaving the car, but there's never been any video located that he ever came back to the car? No. No. Okay. All right. So I'm not sure, uh, you know, what to make of that. I, I get the idea that, you know, once he left the car there, uh, he never came back. There was no proof uh, otherwise. Um, you've talked about the San Francisco Police well, Department. We, Please. Please. So we, well, we, found, we moved the car on Monday. Mm -hmm. So he would have – so he, he parked the car at 4.09 on Saturday. Yeah. So he would have had a day and a half. To go back to the car. Okay. All right. He definitely had the key to the car, though, because mm. the key was lost. Yeah. If, if, I mean, I know you haven't seen the video, but your best guess, that day, of course, it's a Saturday. He would have been parking his car there. I'm sure there were other people there. There were other cars there, I'm guessing. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. So maybe people saw him, they just didn't know he was missing at the time. Right. Well, we, yeah, and we didn't know he was in San yeah. Francisco. Right. Okay. And so there was another sighting of him that very early in the week. I think it was Monday. We didn't get it until later in the week, but there was a AAA towing guy. Who, so if you if you um, were at the Golden Gate Bridge, um, it's on the northern tip of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And if you walk west, you basically, you know, you can go along the coast. And then um, there are several different beaches. And one of the beaches along the coast there has... Um, had a uh, bathroom with those heater dryers, you know, to dry your hands. Yep. And there was a AAA towing guy who had gone into the parking lot, lot there, had used the restroom, and um, when he went in, there was somebody that looked just like Jackson drying his hands. And then when he came out of the bathroom, he was still drying his hands, and you know he. So I, what, what he said was he washed his hands for a long time and he dried his hands for a long time. And then he saw the flyer later in the mm -hmm. week and he said that was the guy that he saw in the, in the bathroom. And, um, and he just, he, this was another guy who described him pretty well and, and said that, um, actually very well. And, um, he said he was kind of muttering under his breath and he was drying his hands and, as I said, Jackson had OCD, and so he would have been, um, you know, very clean, you know, very nervous about being dirty. Mm -hmm. And um, he washed his hands a lot, and he also would get cold. So, you know, it's kind of, you could imagine that he might have slowly gone along the coast from that parking lot, kind of walking and wandering. And then if you went straight from that um Beach parking lot, and went inland, going east. You would hit that Richmond neighborhood, where he was seen at the dry cleaners and the with the the mom and the boy. 
Okay. So we kind of made sort of a, you know, what we thought he might have done was, you know, where he might have wandered along the coast and then and went towards the neighborhood. Okay. You've had a lot of dealings with the San Francisco Police Department. As you also know, uh, a woman you know, of course, Valerie Sorrells, the, the mother of Cameron Reverend, was on Unfound at the end of 2019. Uh, one of the detectives that names came up uh, was Ann McKenzie, who worked on Cameron's uh, disappearance for a while until she retired. Did you have any dealings with Ann McKenzie during any of this? And, um, was she working on uh, Jackson's case as well? No, I had no dealings with um, San Francisco Detectives Office. I don't know anybody there. No. They refused to talk to me because no. Jackson was missing from Cupertino. So they said it was the Santa Clara County Detectives Office job to find Jackson. But the Santa Clara Detectives Office said, we don't have the kind of staff that can go up to San Francisco and look for Jackson. So they couldn't do anything, and San Francisco said, we can't do anything. We've got enough missing people in San Francisco. We can't take other people's cases. So that's how we ended up in the situation with no help. Even though there is video of Jackson being in San Francisco in your car. Correct. Okay. But he's from Cupertino. Right. He, he drove to San Francisco, and apparently a lot of people drive to San Francisco. So they, it's, it's basically, I guess, their way of, you know, parsing out work to other yeah, places that they don't have time to deal with. That is certainly but the right. answer is no. No one would talk to us about okay. I mean, I found, I found one. I found, I should say two. I found two very helpful police officers. But these were people who I happened to come across in my search that were not detectives, but were extremely compassionate, super helpful. They would look up anything in the records for me, and they became they became my friends in San Francisco police. And, um, and it was just out of, you know, relationships and walking around the streets and talking to people. And right. I just found two people that cared. And they were part of the San Francisco police. So but they were not detectives. So who, what governmental, what department does have Jackson's case now? Where is the paperwork? Uh, it's just, the paperwork is in the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office. Okay. Um, there's a guy named Rick Alaney who took over the case. The... Um, the original person retired or something or didn't mm -hmm. want the case or something. So this guy took over, and every time I make I, I leave him a message or email, he never gets back to me. So, you know, there's pretty much nobody doing anything. But I still get tips, so I got a tip last week. Okay. Um. So I, I follow it up myself. I, I call my detective. I call Sergeant Alanis. I tell him about the tip. I ask him to call me, and then he doesn't call. So then I just follow up on my own. And I have a case manager at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I do the same thing with him. I call them. I tell them I've got this tip. Is there anything you can do to help? You know, later I get it. Sometimes I get a call back, but, you know. It turns out that I've realized that if I don't follow up on the tip, it's, it's either going to be too late or nothing. So. Okay. Um, it's just it's to, hard. Please. I assume that everybody must think he's, you know, dead, so they don't think it's worth their time. Uh, that uh, that does happen. There's nothing that I see, uh, and, and with 160 cases. Of experience, uh, there's nothing that I see that would lead me to believe that Jackson is dead. I, and my listeners know that I am always honest about these types of things with the guests. There's nothing that I see here that, to believe that um, that Jackson is dead. And, and in fact, that that kind of takes us into the last part of this interview. 
Gina, is there any proof at all that you've seen over the last, it's going to be 10 years, you know, in a few months, that Jackson went to the San Francisco Bridge and jumped off? Any proof at all? I would say the only proof I have is that he hasn't mm -hmm. called me. Mm -hmm. Because I know that, you know, he loved his family. He's empathetic. He's, you know, and he's not an independent person. Um, you know, if you ask any of his friends, they would probably say he couldn't live on his own, you know, at that time. You know, but, you know, he just was, you know, didn't have the, I mean, there's some kids who, you know, have been out in the wilderness and they, you know, they're good at that kind of stuff. They like camping out. That wasn't Jackson. He loved the comforts of home. He loved the comforts of his bed. You know, he, he was an intellectual and a musician and, a, you know. And he loved his computer and that kind of thing. But, you know, he just... So my biggest, you know, the, the thing that makes me think he's gone is that he hasn't contacted us. And so where else could he be? Right. If he were out there, I think he would contact us. Mm -hmm. So the last tip I got last week was somebody who's, who's seen his picture over the 10 years. And she's a very good friend of my best friend. And um, she happened to be with that friend when she said, "Have they? Has Gina found her son yet? Because I think I just saw him, and he was in San Mateo, which is kind of halfway between San Francisco and Cupertino, in a parking lot, driving a black BMW. So I thought, you know, if he was able to, he was with a girl. Even if he was with a girl who could afford a black BMW." He would have called me, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. I was like, "How could that possibly be?" How you know? Yeah. It didn't. It didn't add up. But yeah. we we're still working on it. There's videotape at the parking lot. We're looking for the videotape. I've got this officer still working on it for some reason. You know, he hasn't done it yet. I bug him every day. You know, what about the videotape? I'm okay. um, still working on it. But that would be something that would be so easy to figure out, you know. The first yeah. thing I asked him is, the parking lot have a video camera. Like, can they get the license plate of this car? If you got the license plate, could you figure out who owns the car? You know, can, we, can you go talk to the person who owns the car? Can you find out if it's Jackson? You know, at least we could put it to bed. But um, there's the guy still looking for the video tape. Have you – I know this would probably be very difficult for you to do, but I have to ask, have you ever watched – the documentary concerning that was made a few years before Jackson disappeared, concerning people who jump off the, the Golden Gate Bridge and commit suicide. Have you ever watched that documentary? No, I can't. Okay, I'm sure you can't. Okay. Because I have, um, and, you know, what I think I learned from it is that 99.9% .9 of the time, if somebody does go off the bridge, somebody who's on the bridge sees it. And uh, because, once again, as you've already stated, the bridge is only open during the day, um, uh, people can't go out there at night, and it is a tourist spot. There's always people walking around, um, you know, especially when it gets to be May, June, the weather's going to be nicer. Uh, I'm inclined to believe that if Jackson had gone off, off the bridge, somebody would have seen it. And obviously that is not the case. That's not the situation. So that that's what leads me to believe that uh, he did not go off the bridge. That's what I think I learned from that documentary. Um, what has this been like? Uh, I know it's. I have to. I ask this question every time. I think that I have to in in my position. What has the last ten years been like, Gina? I guess a nightmare. Like the worst thing that you can imagine came true. Yeah. And a roller coaster. You know, getting my hopes up every time we get a really good lead and then 
not not being able to to get information and then going down with and then afterwards just emotionally going down a big black hole it's really hard to dig myself out of and kind of going through it all over again I guess I've gotten more callous at believing things and and less less likely to go down you know to get the highs anymore because I'm you know when I get a lead because I'm I'm more skeptical and more trying to um, protect myself from going up and down too much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, in talking to other guests, Gina, it's it's hard for people to not ride that remote that emotional roller coaster. Because um, like you, they they get tips, they hear things. Um, and then, you know, those things don't pan out. Uh, of course, in many cases, their remains are found, and then they think it's their son or daughter, and then it turns out to be, you know, somebody else, and, they, you know, they ride that emotional roller coaster. So that's uh, something that we hear quite a bit, you know, on the program. I, I guess the difference maybe in, in Jackson's case is that uh, it doesn't sound like there are any uh, suspects. We... we I'm inclined to believe that a large majority of unfound cases that we cover uh, are murders. Um, but that is, um, there's nothing to show that that's the sign in Jackson's. Uh, nothing that I've heard, you know, or read or anything. So that makes his case there's, a little bit different. Please. Yeah, there's no reason that anybody, mm -hmm. you know, would kill him. But there's, um, you know, it's. The thing is that living on the streets of San Francisco, even for just a couple of days, is a very dangerous thing for a young, you know, very naive, good-looking kid, you know, somebody who's, you know, not street smart. So, you know, he, you know, maybe he lasted a couple of weeks and then he got killed. That could be, but then where the heck is his body? I guess bodies just get, I don't know, thrown in lakes and ocean and who knows. I don't know. Well, I don't know. But I don't want to go there. But, um, you know, he could, have, he could have been injured. I mean, he could have gotten a job in Northern California um, cutting the fields of marijuana because he liked to smoke pot which is what his psychiatrist told him he should go, you know, live up there. He got one of those jobs, and, he, you know, they're super dangerous, especially 10 years ago yep. when people used to go and get those jobs and disappear, and, you know, they never found him again. So that could have happened. Who knows? Yeah. I've thought of a lot of different things. I'm but sure I, you have. I'm sure you have. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the, the frustrating thing is that... It, I have no, no way of finding out. But I have to say that the best thing that helps me deal with this is that I work for Team Hope now, which, um, you know, there's missing people that go missing every day, and their parents um, sign up for emotional support from Team Hope, and I call them, and I help them get through this. And it's been, you know, it's been my way of giving back and of, helping others and making this um, experience at least be worth, you know, while to somebody else. And a lot of those people have found their children. Right. So i got to be happy for them. Yes, absolutely. Do you have a Facebook page or website, anything set up for Jackson, Gina? Yeah, I set up a website page, but um, and about a year or so ago, um, it was on GoDaddy, it was sort of a defunct um, platform, and then I needed to rewrite the whole thing in order for it to, to it, for, I would have had to redo it, and my husband said he would redo it for me, and he never did, so we don't have a web page anymore, okay. and then um, we have a Facebook, we have a several Facebook pages. One is, the very first one we had um, is called uh, Jack 
Jackson Miller dash missing. Uh, help us find him. So it starts with his name on purpose. Um, so that's Jackson Miller dash missing, comma, help us find him. Then there's another one that somebody else, there's these advocates that have signed that have set up websites for him. There's another one that's called um, Help Find Jackson Miller, another Facebook page. And then there's the uh, California Missing Five, because there's right. five young men right. who have been missing around the same time, Cameron, Sean, Christian, and Sean. Yes. Um, and then there is... Um, Missing people in 530-Northern California-West Coast, which he is on. And those are the main ones. Okay. All right, and I will make sure that uh, before the listeners uh, hear us talking, uh, doing this interview, I'll make sure that I uh, link to them on the, our Facebook accounts uh, for Unfound. I'll make sure that that happens. Okay. There's another organization that I'm involved with called Text Witch, and um, this is a group of volunteers and it's a public group that go out and um, hand, like, lunches, bag lunches and so forth to homeless people. And... Um, and while they're, you know, they're helping the homeless, they collect clothes and so forth, and then they get information. They ask them, have you seen these missing people? And often they get tips from other, you know, from homeless people that they've seen these missing people, and they've actually found several people this way. So they go around with posters of Jackson, and I go and help them whenever they're up in this area, help them get out, you know, make sandwiches, get out food and clothing and stuff. Gina, any last words before we complete this interview? Um, just that I, you know, I still hope every day that Jackson is safe, that Jackson's healthy, and that he's, you know, got the strength and the courage to reach out to somebody. My only explanation for why he would be away is that, um, you know, because of his mental state of always having to be perfect and being very shameful of anything that you know, he thinks other people wouldn't like, you know, especially his parents who he loves, that he's trying to get to a situation where he's more perfect before he reaches out to us. And so, you know, my hope is that at some point, you know, he'll just decide that he's, you know, if he is safe and healthy, that it's, uh, you know, that it's okay to reach out to us. Gina, I appreciate you being on this episode of Unfound. Thanks for doing all of this. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome, Gina. And that was my interview with Gina Fanaro, mother of Jackson Miller. I thank her for joining me and all of you on this episode. The interview was actually done in two parts, and maybe you could tell that due to the difference in the sound quality between the first half and the second half. The first half was the way I had been recording interviews. The second half was the new way, using the speakerphone. The second way will be how all interviews are done going forward. In the summary of the case at the beginning of this episode, I spoke about the documentary The Bridge. On Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I linked to it on YouTube in the lead-up to this program, which played on January 17th, 2020. You can watch it for free. I definitely urge anyone who has not watched it yet to do so. 
I think it gives a very good idea of the mentality of those who eventually did jump from the Golden Gate Bridge. It also gives the perspective of the family members who explain what was going on in the person's life before he or she jumped. For me, what caught my attention the most from the film, and I think it's the point that's most relevant to Jackson's disappearance, is that in every single case covered in the documentary, the people who jumped were all seen. Moreover, what I learned is that given the popularity of the Golden Gate Bridge as a tourist destination, the odds of a jumper not being seen are very, very low. So given that, Along with Jackson walking away from the bridge and not toward it, this greatly lowers the odds that Jackson ever went onto the bridge, let alone was able to kill himself unnoticed. But that takes me to my second point, and it goes to the title of this episode. Yes, it's true. The Golden Gate Bridge is the site of many suicides. All very sad, all tragic. I'd like to think all these people could have been talked out of what they did had the right person been there at the right time. But maybe I'm hoping for too much. But what disgusts me is it's obvious to me that the San Francisco Police Department uses the bridge as the reason for way too many disappearances in that city. Why? Because that's easier than investigating the circumstances of each individual case. As an example... It's obvious to me that SFPD is more than happy to believe Cameron Remmer jumped off the bridge, despite what Unfound uncovered over the course of 2019. And I'm sure once we get deeper into Sean Seedy's, Christian Hughes's, and Chris Dickerson's disappearances, the other San Francisco Five Men, we'll find there is nothing showing that they jumped off the bridge either. But if you read between the lines you can see the San Francisco Police Department wants the public to believe otherwise. And where the title for this episode comes from is I got to thinking how exactly far would the bridge have to be away from these disappearances before the San Fran Police Department stopped using the bridge as the reason for these young men not being found. 20 miles, 50 miles, 100 miles, I wonder. I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you used to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.